Welcome to Near and Far, the World Catholicism Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Cavanaugh, Director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University in Chicago. And I'm very pleased to have here today with me Dr. Paul Gifford, who is Professor Emeritus at the SOAS, uh, at the University of London SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, although these days I'm told you're just supposed to say SOAS because the Oriental um, is a kind of outdated term that has various negative connotations. So like Kentucky Fried Chicken is no longer uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, but KFC, now we just say SOAS. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So um, Paul is an expert in African religion, African Christianity, uh, African Catholicism more uh, specifically, and has split his time between London and uh, the continent of Africa, various places in the continent of Africa for the last few decades. But Paul, you're a, uh, a native Kiwi, you're a native of New Zealand, right? Yes, and proud of it, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. It's a good place. Um, and you were, uh, tell us a little bit about your background in New Zealand's Catholicism. Well, uh, Catholicism in New Zealand is a bit different, as I'm only coming to realize now. And of course, Catholicism, when I was growing up, is a very different animal from what it is now. Um, I, I'm prepared to admit that. I haven't really lived in New Zealand for over 40 years, so New Zealand is a bit of a foreign country. But one of the things I think you would notice is that we don't have all the strands that you have. You've got Polish Catholics, Irish Catholics, Italian Catholics, multi... Basically, we're just the Irish oh, okay. link. And again, I don't claim to be the most observant of people. And when I was growing up, I think I did miss a lot. But when I was growing up in New Zealand, okay, the Catholics, I think we identify about 12% of New Zealand as Catholics. And that's another, that's a big difference from Australia, for example. They are much more numerous. Sure. And therefore, they are much more... Uh, they have to be taken into consideration. Whereas I, I never really thought we were in any way different. And we had at the independent Catholic schools, those Cullenite schools that we call, I don't think in America you would have the same dynamics. It's just this Archbishop of Cullen, Archbishop Cullen of Dublin in the 1800s had this idea of these Catholic school, Catholics must be educated away from the secular schools of the state. And that was the model adopted in New Zealand. And I've often wondered, well, in recent years, I've wondered whether, in fact, that was a good idea. Maybe we would have integrated more quickly if we hadn't been, if you follow me. Sure. Um, would that have been a good thing to be integrated more quickly? Well, since we're pretty much integrated, I mean, these schools still exist. Um, and, and in fact, they are tremendously highly valued. As in Britain, I don't know the dynamics here, but all sorts of people who've never darkened the door of the church, when their children are starting to come to school age, immediately affiliate with the church so they can get their children into schools that are highly regarded. And th that doesn't cause problems, but it is an issue that the, the, these schools, um, all my, no, my primary education was half state, half in Catholic schools. That's because we were moving around. Uh, I went to a, a quite a prestigious Catholic secondary school run by the Marist fathers. That's something that also would strike someone from America as different. We don't have the uh, we don't have the variety of religious orders that you do. We've just got Marists, really. Oh, okay. Oh. There are a couple of others now, but really the only one back in those days were the Marists. And 
they tended to be French, which caused a little bit of a problem. Again, I didn't really observe this, but I am told there was a bit of tension between the Irish and the Irish diocesans and the Maoist religious. But anyway, there was the Maoists that ran these quite good schools, and I went to one. Academically, I sub it was okay, but I don't think it was top-notch then. But it was very, very impressive in many ways. I was there in time when everybody on the staff were, was a priest. And they were really inspiring with the work they put in, the, the dormitories they ran, the sports. After school, they would be coaching us. The, all the activities they put on for us. So I have nothing but admiration, really, for, for, for what, what they did. They prepared uh, we, you well we, enough for an academic career. Well, that's, that's another thing you would notice in New Zealand. We have no idea of a denominational university. Mm -hmm. there was, when I was growing up, I think there were only five universities. And, but even now, the idea of a denominational university just wouldn't fly. As in Britain, up till relatively recently, the only universities were state ones. It's only in the last couple of years that a, a few of the original church teachers' colleges have been elevated to university status. But the, one, of my, one of the things I'm quite interested in here, staying at DePaul, is to actually get a handle on what a denominational university means, because I have no experience of them. Except in Africa, right? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. How did you end up in Africa? Well, <laughs> I went um, in New Zealand. I did my first degree is classics. Then I went to seminary, got philosophy, theology, and then got a scholarship overseas to do biblical literature and languages. So I went into Oriental languages. So I've got those, that is my academic background. But when I went to Africa, basically, uh, I can still remember seeing the advertisement of um, University of Zimbabwe in the Department of Religion, Classics and Philosophy. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what I would like. And I was quite interested in liberation theology and I thought, here's my chance to do liberation theology in English. So I jumped at the chance and was lucky enough to get the job. I, I should never have got it. But you might have heard of Adrian Hastings, the sure. historian. He was the head of department then. And he more or less took me up. And I owe a lot to, uh, I owe a lot to him. But anyway, he was me teaching in this religion classics and philosophy department, but this is Zimbabwe, just over the border to South Africa. And everybody with eyes to see could see that apartheid was dying. It just couldn't carry on. So what year are we talking here? Uh, 1980s. Hmm. Yeah. So everybody could see apartheid was dying. And at the same time, all these American preachers started coming through and holding up the Bible and saying, the Bible says, and coming out with some really Reaganite manifesto. And I was fascinated by this, and I used to spend all my time going to these crusades and rallies. And I wrote a small book about it. And it wasn't a very good book at all. But it was the first thing written on this phenomenon of the socio-political, well, the more political role it, in fraught situations. So as a result of that, I got picked up by the All-Africa Conference of Churches, the umbrella body of the Protestant churches, mainline Protestants in Africa. And they gave me this job because they were aware of what was happening to Christianity. They were aware that a lot of, they were losing a lot of members from their denominations, but couldn't quite work out why. And on the strength of that little book I'd written, I got the task of trying to discover what might be going on. So the phenomenon you're talking about is the politicization of the 
Christian churches in Africa, or are they is this the kind of beginnings of the Pentecostal movement there? What tell me? What do you mean by the phenomenon? Well, it was both. I mean, Christianity has always been political, but this was a slightly different dimension, particularly um, the big named evangelical preachers coming to Southern Africa and against communism and communism, the opposite of Christianity and so on. Jerry Falwell made a high profile visit in the 1970s, yes, yes, 70s, yes, 80s. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And, and massive rallies and I presume there was money behind it, um, but it was that anti-communist element in it uh, that, that was one of the major attractions to me. And I used to go and spend all my time watching these and taking part in these rallies and crusades. So as, as I say, it, it's got very little to do with classics, philosophy, theology, or um, um, oriental languages. I've tried to keep some of those up, but it's against the grain, as it were. So the academic career I've had, such as it is, is really not built on the tra academic training I had at all. <laughs> yes. Um, so I presume I, I do sit a bit light to theory, because there are people in the game who say, well, if you know what Weber said, you know what must be happening in Africa. And uh, I don't do that. Basically, all I do is go to churches and sit there and note everything that's happening and write, write it up later. When I was doing Liberia, for example, I could do about, I could average about five church services on a Sunday, starting at six in the morning and ending at nine at night, and then biblical studies during the week and so on. It drove my wife crazy, but, but it really, it, it's, that's what I do. I do. So when people say, oh, if you know Weber or Durkheim, I know what's going on in Africa. I often, I don't, but often I'm tempted to shout, for heaven's sake, go and sit in one of these places and for, tw for 20 minutes and you might find things are a little different. Interesting. So you would consider yourself more of a, what would you say, an, an ethnographer, an anthropologist, a sociologist? Well, I suppose if you have to label me, I'm just an old-fashioned, I'm an old-fashioned ethnographer. I just go and note it all down. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, except in some of your, I mean, in some of your works, you you really do kind of try to draw some at least draw some conclusions from what you're observing and you're not just observing. I mean, when you talk about the plight of Western religion, you have a whole kind of theory of this kind of cognitive shift. That is taking yes, place. okay, okay, yes, that, that one, because that one isn't based on fieldwork. All my other uh, material, it's a bit hard to contradict. If I said, if I say the Seventh-day Adventists were doing this in northern Cameroon in 1986. It's a bit hard to contradict me unless you were there at the same time. But, but that latest book, yes, that is more, it's just having done all that, now what do I think? Yes, so there's theory coming in there. I'm quite interested in the whole secularization thesis. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's triggered by what I note in Africa, this, the, what, I, what is called the enchanted religious imagination versus the uh, definitely non-enchanted, the disenchanted public imagination in the West. So that, that triggered that book. Okay, okay. I want to talk about that a little bit later. Before we get there, um, why don't we um, tell me, I want to hear some stories from your field work in uh, Africa. I'm going to ask you to talk about what do you... What, First of all, what did you find most uh, interesting or promising in uh, uh, Catholicism in Africa? Well, one of the things that I found so promising, um, I was just coming online, as it were, when um, the one-party states of Africa virtually collapsed. And 
particularly the Francophone, the French-speaking areas, had these national conferences of everybody. What are we going to do? The country is falling apart. What will we do? And every so often, it would be the Catholic Archbishop of the country, the Cardinal, or, or the main church leader, who would be asked to chair this meeting. And that surprised people, because when colonialism ended, People thought, oh, Christianity, which was so associated with colonialism, it will cease to be as important as it was. But quite the contrary. When they had these national conferences, these people stepped up. Um, well, they were asked to, to chair these meetings. So, the, so the, and, and it wasn't so much to do with any liberation theology or anything like that. It was just the moral stature of some of these people, mm -hmm. like Cardinal... Um, Cardinal Toomey in, in Cameroon. Actually, he wasn't, but because the president managed to avoid a national conference. But everybody was saying, let's have a national conference with Cardinal Toomey running the, the place. Similarly, in Zaire, the um, Cardinal Monsignor Passigna, who's just died recently, yeah. uh, he would have been the chair if Mobutu had allowed one to take take place. Uh, so the moral standing of some of these people really was, it was just so impressive and, and relatively unexpected. Hmm. For a, an undemocratic institution, the Catholic Church has had a, a role in democracy movements in a surprising number of places since the 1980s, you know, from East Timor to South Korea to yes. Poland yeah. to Chile to Malawi to Togo, Mozambique, etc. Yes, well, I think um, um, Timor-Leste is the, is the exact parallel, the, the, the Archbishop there, who got the Nobel Prize for what he did. But <coughs> it's the same factor, I think. It's not so much the theology. It's not that everybody says... Catholicism is right, and transubstantiation over uh, the indefectibility of the saints or anything like that. Right. It's just the moral stature of these people. And, and that is very, very important. And it's still the case. I mean, Cardinal uh, Archbishop Sarpong, if you heard that lecture of the, the Beret lecture uh, uh, last month, um, again, a, a giant in, in Ghana because of his moral stature. So let's talk a little bit about the other side of it then. What do you find most problematic about Catholicism in Africa? Well, you mentioned before my comment about the NGOization. Um, I, I, I probably wouldn't have re referred to that as a problem or problematic. Uh, let me say at the beginning, I don't know. If I was all of a sudden elected president of Africa, what would I do? I don't really know. I don't think you need to worry about that. <laughs> I don't have the answers. But right. I, I'm, I'm just, as I say, I, I tend to be a documentor rather than a theoretician of what is going on or what might be going on. But I can't help noticing the... NGOization, the, the, the amount of aid that's available to churches is considerable. Because, say the United States will not give overseas aid to a government. They're regarded as fairly unaccountable. But to church, how can I put it, wholly owned subsidiaries of church bodies like, um, um, like church, Catholic aid, um, what's the American name of it? Um, uh, Catholic Relief Services. Catholic, sorry, yes. Catholic Relief Services. Um, yes, so much of their money, in fact, in some years in Ethiopia, all their money comes from the United States government. It can't go to the Catholic Church for evangelization, but it can go to the Catholic subsidiary for relief and development. And... The shift, I think, is discernible that the Catholic Church is in many places coming to be seen as this body involved in relief and development rather than particularly, specially, directly religious 
things, if that distinction holds up. Sure. So you talked in your the talk that you gave for us a few days ago, you talked about universities and healthcare centers and you know, the churches involved in agriculture and so on, and oftentimes these sorts of organizations tend to downplay the the Catholicism and kind of operate more or less as a as an NGO. Um, can you say a little bit more about that, about the kind of downplaying of the Catholic identity? Well, for example, just recently a, a thesis I examined in Denmark, a young woman doing a thesis on the church in Uganda, and the, the uh, uh, sorry, Uganda is rather special because it is almost a, a, a duopoly. The Catholics and the Anglicans even have their own political parties, or what is seen as political parties, and they've been vying for control right from the beginning. Now, um, the Anglican Church, you just got to go to their offices and see this is the church office. Over there is the development wing of the church. It's their office. And you just look which is the more important. <laughs> and that sort of thing. And in her, she was studying one of these rural areas. And the Anglican priest received what was the equivalent of $6 a month which enabled him to buy, I think, a few chickens or a couple of eggs, but certainly not survive. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Catholic priest had been to America and he had studied in America and had made contacts who had actually looked after him thereafter. And with that money that he got from personal contacts, this is not government money, this is personal contacts, he started an orphanage and before too long, she was saying the orphanage, because that's where the money was, that started to dominate his wonderful activity. I mean, he was totally devoted yeah. and, and worked very, very hard. But the work tended to be done with the institution that he'd been able to set up. Uh, I mean, I don't want to advocate the Anglican model uh, because the poor priest just couldn't survive. And as a result of that, of course, um, unaccountability, a little bit of favoritism is, is rife in the in the, her Anglican parish. The Catholic Church doesn't have to descend to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you find this problematic because you think that it's um, it can be a kind of getting away from the primary focus of the church and making it into a kind of this worldly as opposed to other worldly kind of organization. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, and I link this with the whole Pentecostal explosion because I, um, I have long argued that one of the great appeals of this new wave in Africa of the, these new churches I don't want to caricature them because they do vary a lot, but I don't. I think the, the biggest appeal of them is they cater for that enchanted religious imagination. If somebody is convinced her daughter has malaria as a result of a spell or some witch or some ill-intentioned person casting the, the spell. The pastor, in many cases, will actually meet that need, will diagnose the spirit responsible and cast it out. Now, the Catholic Church, it seems to me, is fairly useless for somebody with that mentality. And I suspect that mentality is much wider than official Catholicism admits. But don't Catholics in Africa also have this kind of emphasis on the supernatural and spirits and, uh, you know, witchcraft, um, casting out uh, evil spirits and that sort of thing? Not really. I, I think I'm not going too far and saying not really. That there are places like Ghana where there have been quite flourishing 
charismatic movements within the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But as far as I can see, they tend not to stay in the Catholic Church. They're a stepping stone towards fully independent Pentecostal churches rather than meeting a need within Catholicism. And that's the reason, for example, when we lived in Kenya, um, the Archbishop of Nairobi banned all Catholic charismatic groups for this reason, that basically they were... Official Catholicism does not approve, really, that mentality underlying the exorcism of demons and this enchanted uh, religious imagination. And that makes sense because they're so busy running schools and clinics which have a totally different way of explaining misfortunes in life. And the Catholic Church has invested most of its resources in combating that and doesn't really handle very well, it seems to me. Mind you, I don't really know what I would do myself, but I just think it is worthwhile to point out that there is this difference. So when you say official Catholicism, you mean at the level of the bishops and the priests and so on, but is among the Catholic faithful, there's presumably still a lot of you know, what you would call an enchanted uh, imagination. I would say so, yes, and that's why the drain away to the Pentecostals is so considerable. Because there, in these new Pentecostal churches, these needs are met, whereas they're not in Catholicism. And in that drain, I think, is a real thing. It's worth pointing out. I mean, um, Oyedepo in Lagos has the biggest church building in the world. It can seat 54,000 people. It, and that same group, Winners Chapel, has recently built what they claim is the biggest single church in East Africa, in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So these, these churches, I get criticized quite often. I get criticized for all sorts of things. <laughs> but one of, one of the big ones is that I worry about mega churches, the big ones, rather than the thousands of little ones. But I would answer that by saying these virtuosos, these real Pentecostal stars, are the models for so many. Okay, many of the, uh, many of the others can't reach that standard, but the, what they're modeling themselves on is, is, is these, these people. Like the the um, prophet Joshua, who just buried last month in, in, in Lagos, for example, um, he's totally this enchanted imagination. He can solve all your, um, all your issues, all your misfortunes, and presidents come. Several African presidents go and stay with Prophet Joshua in Lagos because he was known to have these gifts. Chaluba, the president of Zambia, these people, um, they go and do this. So it's not the case that it's uneducated. The non-elite go to these people. This is a real phenomenon. I, I think I could link that up also with the... Um, the institutional side of Catholicism is simply so big and it just takes so much effort to run that really Catholic attention is focused on Catholic things rather than, there's not really a criticism because I think it is the, it's the nature of the beast. If you've got something like the Catholic education system as they presently exist and the Catholic health system, the effort required to run them takes up all your attention and all your, all your energy. And as a result, what's actually going on in the wider world, I think sometimes may be neglected. Very often going around Africa, I've stayed with various groups of missionaries and all sorts of places. And sometimes I say, that church on the corner, what's that? And surprisingly, often... I would get the reply, I have no idea. So, so the picture that you're painting for us then is uh, Catholics on the one hand who are concerned with running these institutions of education and healthcare and agriculture and so on that are um, 
this worldly uh, and neglecting the the kind of otherworldly duties of religion. And on the other hand, you've got the Pentecostals who are immersed in this kind of spirit world, this supernatural world, um, who in some ways are neglecting uh, other kinds of uh, more important issues. You, you said something in your talk about, you know, you can you can talk about uh, the processions of the Trinity in your ivory tower, but really what theology ought to be concentrating on is kind of questions of war and militarism and so on. I mean, is there a, is there a middle position where you're both taking into account the kind of proper, um, you know, otherworldly uh, theological questions at the same time when you're uh, not kind of immersed in in these in the excesses of, you know, demons and, and witches and so on. I don't claim to have pinpointed the exact middle position that everybody <laughs> should be espousing, but I, I sometimes I uh, sometimes I do venture to half criticize some of the African theologians who are not in my opinion, dealing with the sort of thing you've spoken about, a middle position, given that this is the reality we've got, what should the church be doing? I, in my opinion, think that some of the Catholic theology, especially that on enculturation, deal with issues that, well, to me, don't hit the spot. Now, I'm, I'm well aware, and Stan has made this very clear to me, that <laughs> this is Father Stan Chuilo, the uh, one of our associates from Nigeria here at the center. Yes, that that um, he's made very clear that it's no real criticism of somebody else to say they're not worried about your issues. <laughs> I treat them on their own issues. Right. But nevertheless, to me, I think the 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 Catholic Church in Africa does have um, this. It's almost a schizo. That's maybe going a little far, but I was going to say it almost has the schizoid operation that all its energy goes into development. The theologians are interested in something else, hmm. in culturation. And as I say, rightly or wrongly, uh, if I were a theologian, I would try to grapple with something in the middle. So you're thinking, you mentioned liberation theology before, kind of an African liberation theology is what you're looking for? Yes, I don't think you would find much of that in Africa. Maybe you didn't, you would know more about this than I would, but maybe you didn't find as much in Latin America as we were led to believe. But um, I, apart from South Africa, nobody, oh, nobody, but very few even attempted that. And there was a justification for that. I mean, uh, in Veng in, in Cameroon, he would argue that the issues are different. And it's anthropological poverty was the word he used to explain the plight in Africa rather than economic poverty enforced by the United States on the periphery and so on. Um, so the issues in Latin America were different. In Africa, the, the missionaries came despising the local people, so it's anthropological poverty, therefore the stress on culture, to defend ourselves, to promote Africanness. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so the, the sort of liberation theology we were led to believe flourished in Latin America from Gutierrez and Boff and so on. I don't think there's much of that in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, apart perhaps from South Africa with the Kairos document and things like that. Mm -hmm. But this is something that you would see then as, as a kind of way forward. Um, so uh, avoiding the extremes on the one hand of kind of neglecting Catholicism for development work and on the other hand kind of pouring all your energy into fighting demons and, and witches, what, what you would want to see is more um, of this kind of attention to social transformation in a theological vein? Would that be fair to say? I think you've expressed my opinion in, in 
too extreme a form, or I wouldn't put it quite so extreme. It's just that they neglect this, they, ne they neglect Catholicism for development. I wouldn't have put it like that, um, because all, all the mission, they, they could tell you quite eloquently that this is Catholic motivation, it's Catholic faith demands this and so on. So I, I wouldn't say they're neglecting one for the other, but the, the way it appears, the, the, the reality on the ground, as it were, the, the, stress, the way the Catholic Church is seen, its status, its position in society, which is, which is enormous in Africa. Because in, in many countries, I remember going to Zaire, northern Zaire when it was Zaire, and there's whole areas there the size of Belgium, effectively run by the Catholic Church. Sure. The postal service, any, any post service that worked was the Catholic Church. The development, um, if you wanted your car fixed, you had to go down to the Catholic mission because <laughs> there'd be a mechanic down there. Yeah. So uh, the way the Catholic Church is seen, yes, yes. So let's talk a little bit more about this comparison that you've made to uh, the development of the West, um, you've kind of said that Denmark is the uh, is the goal, right? Um, but so you know, a, a well functioning democracy where there's not a lot of poverty and and people are taken care of and fairly tolerant society and so on. That that seems to be the goal. Um, but you, but you've also said that um, the closer that you get to this goal of development, the more secular it's bound uh, to become. So, is secularization uh, and our, our secularization and development do they go hand in hand? Well, that's the sort of issue that I wish people would grapple with. I don't have the equipment to grapple with that, but. To me, that is exactly the issue. That getting to Denmark, I, it's quite a nice phrase, I thought. It actually comes from a World Bank document, but Fukuyama takes it up and runs with it. Um, I think it's a way of avoiding saying we must be like America, the great Satan, because we don't <laughs> want to be like that. And we don't want to be like Britain or France because of their colonial past. Whereas Denmark, a bit like New Zealand, it doesn't threaten anybody. Uh, so just it's a bland way of saying we've got to sort of get a democracy that works, an education system, a health system, a transport system that works. But you're quite right, I think, or well, that's what I tried to argue in that last book, that, that the more you start thinking in terms of that rationality of functional instrumentality, the less you advert to the otherworldly, which up till a couple of hundred years ago in the West was pervasive. The Catholicism was about relics and novenas and prayers and uh, not vaccinating your cow, but praying for the cow. So, so uh, we used to be like that, but over the last couple of hundred years, this new mentality has come in and it hasn't disproved that other reality at all. But it's just that people don't, or so often, people don't advert to that. Uh, no need to. Of course, if you put a microphone in their face and say, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in saints? Do you believe in these things? Well, yes, yes. But in fact, they haven't thought about them for 10 years. And that's the sort of thing. I don't, th I think well, I'm just saying that nowadays, that attention to the supernatural is totally countercultural. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't be countercultural, but it's just jolly hard unless you set your mind to be it. So let me play devil's advocate here. And I, I don't think you and I probably agree on this question of enchantment and, and disenchantment. Um, you take Weber's diagnosis of disenchantment of the West at face value, and I'm not sure I do. Um, you say relics, for example, are a relic of the past uh, in the West. Um, but I um, can think of, you know, a baseball that Babe Ruth autographed, you know, which sells for a half a million dollars. What's the difference between that and a relic? 
Sorry, what was that last bit? Uh, say that <laughs> what again? is the difference between, uh, you know, you, you uh, a baseball that Babe Ruth hit? Oh uh, yes, what's the difference? Can sell for a half a million dollars. Um, it's different than a saint's bone, which is venerated, but but not not much. I mean, it seems that you've still got what Charles Taylor calls charged objects in the so-called secular and disenchanted West, um, but now they're consumer items, uh, for example, right? The, um, you know, Charles Taylor talks about buffered selves, but he's never seen people standing outside of the Best Buy at midnight on Thanksgiving waiting to burst into the store and get all the discount televisions uh, on, on Black Friday. You know, there seems to be a kind of enchantment there. You know, Taylor kind of hints at this. He talks about a consumerism as a stronger form of magic that um, kind of takes people away from Christianity but into a different kind of realm of magic. How would you respond to that idea that, that the West is not, in fact, disenchanted, but is just differently enchanted or misenchanted, as Gene McCarriher says? Well, I think I'd agree with all that. that the, the, this uh, rationality of functional instrumentality. That, and incidentally, Weber didn't approve of that. Weber, in, you're aware of that, that Weber more or less said, we're in a mess. Um, right. Actually, yeah, I don't even think Baber thought ultimately that we are disenchanted. He talks about how uh, many old gods ascend from their graves and take the form of kind of uh, abstract uh, entities. So he, yeah, I think Baber was very much more divided on this question than people ordinarily think. Yes, exactly. Um, but I, I, yeah, you see the similarities. I suppose I tend to see the dissimilarities. I mean, I'm not saying that the West, modern America, is is rational. I mean, we've seen this with the anti-vaxxers and so on. But the very fact that the conspiracy now, conspiracy theories now, are about Democrats in Washington having pedophilia parties and so on, that's, to me, I would see that's quite different from um, St. Teresa or St. Rock, or the relics of St. Mark and Venice achieving something. That, that, there is a difference. St. Mark's relics doing something, or St. Januarius, that's on one level. The Democrats in Washington, I mean, it's, every, it's certainly irrational, but it's an irrationality of a this-worldly kind. Mm -hmm. Does that fly? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so um, you've got this dichotomy of kind of otherworldly and thisworldly. You know, the subtitle of your book is uh, The Eclipse of the Otherworldly in the West. Um, I wonder if we could... Uh, and so you, in some ways, you, so the title of the book is The Plight of Western Religion. And that this this whole kind of emphasis on the otherworldly has been eclipsed because of this uh, kind of this worldly um, point of view. And in Africa, the problem seems to be, in some ways, the the reverse. That there's this kind of enchanted imagination which doesn't pay enough attention to uh, to this world, um, or um, this kind of what you call it, a kind of schizoid imagination in which you've got uh, emphasis on you know education and healthcare and not enough emphasis on uh, the, the the core beliefs of uh, of the church maybe we could just um, uh, finish up by I'm I've just elected you Pope and I want you to give me us your vision of the way forward um, uh, out of this kind of dichotomy between the this worldly and the otherworldly, what um, what do you see as the the way forward for the Catholic Church, uh, both in Africa and uh, and in the West? I suppose all I could say was I see there are real issues in development as we have it now, uh, 
And I just wish people would grapple with the issues that arise from that rather than issues that I don't see as quite so important. Uh, your book on violence, for example, made this point of this of differentiating realm. And I that's one of the things I'm looking into while I'm here or trying to observe is the lack of differentiation. When people use the word religious, what are they actually referring to? And I would like to distinguish the cultural, the political. You, maybe you can't do it perfectly, but you could have a try. Um, for, Wolf, in one of his books, refers to some the Second Baptist Church in Dallas or so. It could be Houston. I, I can't remember exactly. But it's got 84 baseball teams, 32 soccer teams, for, um, a gym, a drama club, um, cycling clubs, athletics, 15 of this, 20 of that. Now, if I was a single mother, all of a sudden going to Houston or Texas or wherever it was, of course I would join that church. Of course I would. Does that commit me to belief in the indefectibility of the saints and this sort of thing? I don't think it does. Um, and therefore, to use the figures from that church as showing that America has resisted secularization, whereas Europe hasn't, I think that's illegitimate because if one distinguished the cultural, the political, the social, the, the religious, which you, now you can try to do, I think another picture could emerge. That's, that was basically the thinking behind the, that last book, the, the Plight. And remember that I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, the, the otherworldly. I'm just saying that our cultures in the West are now so run on productivity, profit, degrees in economics, economics, business studies, IT, this sort of thing. The more you're immersed in that world, the less you are confronted with the other reality until you get a death or something like that. Um, but by and large, you may, you may hardly ever refer to that. Now, that is a new thing, I think, and therefore that, that raises big problems for Christianity, for theology, and I just wish they would grapple with it. So you've given us a pretty pessimistic picture of um, Christianity in the West, uh, and also a pretty pessimistic picture of Christianity in Africa. Um, do you want to end on a, a hopeful note, or do you want to just leave us there? Uh, I wouldn't use the word pessimistic or optimistic. I would have said, um, yes, I am highlighting issues. I'd put it like that. I'm highlighting issues that probably are not insuperable, but I just wish more. I, I don't... I was quite struck with an article by um, Andrew Walker from the Southern Baptist Seminary um, re recently on this point about, yes, you know, I, I presume he was referring to the way Christianity has been used to oppress racial minorities and so on. And he said, yes, yes, I know some of that has happened and we all want Christianity to be, to be as pristine as we can get it. But nevertheless, um, be careful advocating the separation of Christianity from culture because pretty much all we've got from hospitals, schools, universities, charities, orphanages, um, social services, all this comes from Christianity. And I, th I thought he expressed that very, very well. And um, I don't think, well, in that article, he didn't have the answers either. But he's just saying, be careful. I know these issues are there, but be careful just going too hard at them and too unthinkingly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This has been a delight, and we'll continue our, our conversation off the air. But thanks so much for, for joining us, and thanks for being here in Chicago for a few months with us. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. It's been wonderful. Near and Far is produced by the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, a research institute focused on Catholicism around the world with special attention to the church in the global south. 
The center is sponsored by DePaul University, a Catholic university in the Vincentian tradition in Chicago. Production assistance for near and far comes from Marlon Aguilar, Finnegan Chu, and Karen Kraft. For more information on the center and its activities, look for the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology on the web, Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, and YouTube.